We welcome you to this worship during Good Friday, a time in which liturgically we revisit the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Almighty God, your Son Jesus Christ was lifted high upon the cross so that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we, who glory in this death for our salvation, may also glory in his call to take up our cross and follow him. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. going through some of my children's rooms and trying to figure out what could be moved along. And I came across a book that held great value in the hearts of my family. We called it the Blue Book because it was a big, thick book of nursery rhymes. Big, strong book. And every night, my husband and I would take turns reading stories from the book. The children loved them. They especially loved the stories with happy endings. They would often ask us to skip over the hard parts to go right to the happy ending because the story of Humpty Dumpty falling off that wall or the big bad wolf coming after the pigs or any of the other trials that these characters had were hard to hear as a kid and they wanted a good ending. Christians are no different. We like to avoid the hard parts of the Bible, especially the hard part of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Instead, we love to hear the stories of the Bible about rescue and restorations. We love stories about miracles and healings and victory over death. We all love stories that tell us that everything will be okay and we're going to be all right. We love to hear about God's great love for us and his mercy toward us. We love knowing that we get to pick up the banner of hope and carry it in front of us throughout our lives. We love all the glorious promises of a restored Israel and the visions of a new Jerusalem. We love to live in those happy spots in our messages, in our churches, and in our spiritual lives because they give us something to hold on to in the darker, more challenging moments threatened to overwhelm us. We're not unique as Christians in this propensity to want to hear uplifting message. It is human nature, after all, to seek out what is good. It is normal to, to want what is hopeful and stray away from the hard parts. It's easy for us as a church to turn off the television when we hear about the gruesome violence against a group of people that are not deserving. We like to turn off the stories that talk about the hate that people have for any one group of people, even though God condemns it and declares it sinful. 
We like people to remind us about our successes and victories, and we naturally prefer for people not to point out our missteps and our shortcomings. It's human nature to seek out people that make us feel good and stories that make us feel good. It's normal for us to want to talk with people who can help us go where we want to go, but not to hear about the hardship or the pain or the sacrifice that they made so that we might get to where we need to be. Consider the story of Caroline, the daughter of a single mother who was working three jobs. She wanted to help her daughter have a better life, and she sacrificed. But hear the revelation that Caroline had. For so long ago, she says, I was content to soak up all that my mother had to offer and to let her sacrifice on my behalf. I enjoyed the privileges that her sacrifices earned me, the provisions and the comforts I enjoyed, the opportunity for an education, and the adulations that academic success brought with it. I told myself that she wanted to do it, and that it was her choice, and that I didn't need to constantly revisit or acknowledge her many contributions to my advancement. I told people how I had gotten my college degree and how I had hope in my future, and they were proud of me. And I thought that was enough, making her proud, until a friend asked me a question that stopped me in my tracks. He said, what was it like for your mom? What price did she have to pay for all your success? In that moment, I realized I had lost over the hard parts of her story because I enjoyed too much the glory spots of my blessings. I had denied myself a front row seat into the true cost involved in my success and not listened, not visited those stories and those memories because I was too busy being blessed by what she had done for me. When I realized what I had done, I had skipped the part of the story of what she really did. I forced myself to sit with her and listen, to listen to the story, to hear the hard parts, and only then did I appreciate the gift of a new life that I have received. And this, my friends, is where we find ourselves as Christians every Holy Week. As Christians, we long to jump from the joy and the celebration of Palm Sunday, where the crowds are gathering and waving their palm branches, crying to the Lord as he enters Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we want to go right to the glorious celebration of Easter. We want a Jesus who arrives triumphantly, who leads, who conquers, and who gives us hope. But tonight, my friends, is all about forcing ourselves out of our comfortable, happy armchairs and opening ourselves up to the harder story of Jesus' sacrifice. It's hard because the Good Friday story involves rejection, betrayal, denial, condemnation, suffering, and gruesome death. It's hard because tonight we get a front row seat to what Jesus was willing to do for us to help us overcome our sin and live in right relationship with our God. But we know as Christians that we can never be fully reconciled to God on our own. For as it says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That free gift did not come without a price, just as Caroline's chance at a blessed life did not come without a price. And while it may be uncomfortable to think about the suffering of Jesus, it is crucial if we are going to appreciate the glory of Easter. The betrayal and rejection and condemnation and punishment, suffering and death of Jesus Christ is a critical part of God's salvation story that the prophets foretold. Over 700 years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Isaiah wrote about the Lord's suffering servant in Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6. Hear now these words. 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah tells us what will happen. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Tonight is about giving space to hear about the hardship that Jesus went through so that we can experience full communion with God through the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' final words on the cross, which we will soon hear in our readings, he declares, it is finished. But Jesus is not giving up in those words. The system didn't beat Jesus Christ because he said, it is finished. To the contrary, those three words convey that he obeyed and fulfilled the will of God. He accomplished all that God wanted him to accomplish, that he would lay down his life as a testimony for God's great love for us all. To the contrary, he laid down his life so the bondage of sin and death might be broken, And taken up in the cross is the healing of the world. As it says in Hebrews 10.10, We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Let us pray. Eternal God, you looked into the hearts and lives of humanity and saw sin without end. When sacrifices and rituals and promises to to turn away from our sin failed to turn our hearts back to you, you offered us a new covenant through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his suffering and sacrifice on the cross, we are made whole, freed from our sins for new life with you. Help us on this night to hear the hard parts with openness and humility and to give thanks and praise for the great mediator of our lives, Jesus Christ, whose self-giving love reveals your magnificent love for us all. Amen. We invite you now to relive the drama of the passion of our Savior, Jesus Christ, through these readings and through the music. Our first reading. Jesus went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back, and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the band of the officers of the Judean authorities seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. 
It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the religious authorities that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. second reading from the scriptures. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. 
As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman who guarded the gate said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. They said to him, Are not you also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. Take him yourself, 
and judge him by your own law. The religious authorities said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to them, to show by what death he was to God. Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the religious authorities. But my kingship is not of the world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went to the religious authorities again and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas, even though Barabbas was a robber. Put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. 
They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The religious authorities answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was the more afraid. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the religious authorities cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, and in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the religious authorities, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. They handed him over to them to be crucified. Oh,
fifth reading. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the Place of the Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this title. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priest then said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers had crucified Jesus, and they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots, for to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clovis, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing all was now finished, said, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there. So they put a sponge full of the vinegar on his and held it to his mouth. Then, when Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
Reading number six. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, the religious authorities asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. When they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead and would not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it was born witness. His testimony was true, and he knows that he tells the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him who they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the religious authorities, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had come at first to him by night. He came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds of weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloth with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there.
peace and silent reflection. May the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who suffered on the cross and died for our sins, remind you and humble you as you remember the magnitude of God's self-giving love. Amen.